Thank you, Margie. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, everyone. Really good to see you today. It is a privilege to worship together. It's a privilege to open God's word. It's a privilege to greet one another, to pray together. We are a privileged people. I do want you to know that you were prayed for today. And when I think about our prayer meetings, and I encouraged our group uh, two weeks ago, that the most important meetings this church has are our prayer meetings. Because those meetings impact all the other meetings that happen around here. And I sincerely mean that. And so there's opportunities for us to pray together, especially the first um, Sunday night of every month, 6 o'clock. I encourage you to come out. I know we're busy. I get all that. But this matters. It matters a lot. Every week, Monday nights, there's a prayer gathering. We pray. We pray for you. We pray for our world. We pray for situations. And so prayer matters, and your prayers matter. They matter because we have a God who does care, a God who does listen, a God who does meet and respond and live in and lead his people. Today I am uh, excited to start this new series and also a little intimidated because of the grandiosity, <laughs> grandiosity, <laughs> the greatness of our text this morning. And so if you do have a Bible, go ahead and turn open to the Gospel of John. We're going to look at John chapter 1 and the first 18 verses. And looking at these verses, boy, it is easy to preach a whole series of messages right with inside of these verses. This morning, I'm trying to capture for us, really, the greatness of Christ. Now, each week, we will see an object that's over here that kind of uh, encapsulates or is a focal point for the message of that week. And today, we'll see in the passage that Christ candle this morning. Or you are an atheist and believe there's no God, to agnostic, who are not quite sure how we view the world, how we view ourselves, how we view eternity. It matters. And my hope is that through this series, through this message for two groups of people, that if you are a Christian, that your um, worship of Christ will grow grander, that your vision of Christ will grow wider. That your love for Christ would grow deeper in your heart and that he would be made great or expanded within our hearts and within our minds. That's my prayer for us. Those of you who are perhaps on the edge or you're investigating Christianity, the prayer is that you would see Christ, who he is, what nature itself, what the word itself, what the spirit itself says to us. That's my prayer for you in this series. And we pray that your heart would be open, our minds would be open, that God would help us, myself and others, communicate what's in this sacred, precious, and powerful word in front of us. That is the prayer. Now, in understanding the Gospel of John, I'm just going to say a few things about the author. The author is the um, disciple of Jesus named John, son of Zebedee. So there was James and John. And Peter was included in the closest, perhaps, in relationship to Christ. This is that John who continued to write not just the gospel, and he is the only writer in the New Testament that's written in all three genres in the New Testament. He wrote a gospel, which we're going to jump in today. He wrote letters or epistles, which would be 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, right near the end of the Bible. And he is the one who God, Christ, revealed himself and wrote the book of Revelation. John loved Christ, devoted his life to him. Perhaps he was Jesus' best friend while on earth. 
It is written that it says that he is a disciple that Jesus loved. And of course, he loved all of his disciples. But John was, I would think, particularly close to his heart. I'm moved to read in the book of Revelation that here was this man who was literally tortured for his belief and his testimony that Jesus was the Christ, was alone, away from, cast away from all those he had loved besides Christ. And on the Lord's day, by his own, he was worshiping the risen Christ, and Christ met him. This is John who, through the power or empowerment of the Holy Spirit, has penned this gospel that is similar to the other gospels, Gospels, but dissimilar to them as well, where John highlights various things. In uh, John chapter 20, John gives to us the reason why these, this book was written. Makes it very, very clear why they were written. And this is what it says in John uh, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. So this kind of gives us the context for our um, walk through this gospel. John wrote this and said, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of, his, of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's where we get the title for this sermon series, Life in His Name. And that's the Holy Spirit's aim in this book, that we would believe that Jesus indeed is the Christ, that He indeed is who He said He was, the Son of God. And that by believing, we would receive life in his name. So again, the purpose of this message and this series is that you would believe. And John and the other apostles could, could have written many more things about Christ. But the things that were specifically chosen, these signs, and there are eight signs in this gospel, point to and drive home the centrality, the importance of who the Christ is, telling us it is indeed Jesus. Jesus is the focal point of the Gospels, the center point of the Bible. There is no other name that is greater than his. What a beautiful name it is. Amen. So this morning, I have three points. I'm going to give them to you right up front, okay? So you know everything is hanging from these things. First point is the greatness of the Word. The second point is the greatness of His life. The third point is the greatness of His glory. And I ask that God would impact us by the greatness of who He is. So here's the first point, the greatness of the word. And by the way, if you're online, there are notes available for you over at our website. And go over to um, uh, crosspointrockford.com and you'll find them there. And there's notes for us here. And again, there's lots of stuff I'm going to endeavor to cover. I'll try to keep us moving as we will conclude with communion uh, at the end of the service. And one of my favorite songs of recent days, which I'm looking forward to the singing together. So first we see in this text the greatness of the word. John chapter 1, starting with verse 1. I'm reading from the NIV this morning. It says this, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. 
We're going to stop there. So in these three short verses, the world is seen. There's four things I want us to take a look at about the word, which is Christ. And John shows us who this is as he marches us to reveal the name of this person, starting out with the word. We learn about this word that he, which is a person, is eternally pre-existent. He, Christ, is eternally pre-existent, always was. The word always was and was always. He does not have a beginning nor does he have an end. He was not created, but eternally pre-existent was always. In the beginning was the word. I want that just to sink in. Jesus is like no other. We also learn from this passage that he is eternally in relationship. For it says the word was with God. Kind of mind-blowing. So God always existed in relationship within the trinity of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. They're distinct and yet the same. One as three and three as one. Distinct but the same. Always in perfect relationship from eternity Eternity past, existing together. When God invites us into relationship with him, he is inviting us into the glory that he is. God is eternally pre-existent. He is eternally pre-existent. He is eternally in Relationship. Thirdly, we look, read from these first abuses, verses that he is eternally God. The word did not become God. There are books out there, one in particular that became quite popular, that the title said, when, when, How Jesus Became God, or When Jesus Became God. God. Jesus always was God. The Word was God eternally. Always God and always will be God. He was with God and was God from and for Eternity. Fourthly, we learn that he is eternally creator. That through him, all things were made. He is what is called the uncaused cause. If we live in a cause and effect universe, that one thing causes another. If we go to the beginning, there was God, uncaused, always present in relationship. This is the word that everything that has been made came from him. The book of Colossians describes it this way. This is Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 16. It says this, for by him... All things 
were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Think about that. By him all things were created. Not just what we can see, be it earth and sky, heaven and the heavens, be it the trees or the mountains, all things were created, both tangible and intangible, supernatural beings, thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities, they all were created through him and also for him. Regardless if you know it or not, you were created for Christ. That matters. There is intentionality to you. Intentionality in this world. Not haphazardness, but purpose. They were created, we were created through him. For him and all things hold together in him. Christ wanted to, he could speak a word, and you and I would no longer be held together. This is the uniqueness of Christ. He is the center. He is at the center of all things. Which means you are not the center of all things. We get that so wrong, don't we? I want us to bask in these words. That they would sink in and shape our thoughts about Christ and his uniqueness about God and his uniqueness, the power and the majesty, glory, strength and the wisdom and the love that is in God, the creator of all things. In the beginning was the word. He is great. Worthy to be praised. Now next, John goes on, and this is the next main point, the greatness of his life. John chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up, verse 4. Now in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, and the light shines in the darkness. We're going to pause there and see this point. He is the light revealed. In him is, was, and always will be life. He is the source of all things that live. Life comes from him because he is life. Non life does not gain, life does not gain its life from non-life. Let me put it that way. All things that are alive comes from Christ because he himself is life. Source of all life. 
In him was life. And he changes now and, and makes this image. And that life was the light of all human kind. So by him, that is life, comes the power of being and knowing and understanding. Light, when brought to a place, illuminates everything else. Have you ever been in a completely black place? Have you ever been in a place like that? Where the light or the lack of light is almost oppressive. Where literally you cannot see your hand in front of your face. In that darkness, we know very little. We under, don't understand our environment, or perhaps, could you imagine never being able to see from birth, not knowing? But when the light appears and illuminates everything, allowing us to see, to understand, to know. Light allows us to know and see all things. So Christ allows us to know and see all things. Without light, without life, without Christ, we see nothing. We know nothing. We are nothing. And the light shines in the darkness. It stands in contrast to all other things. The light is revealed. It's shown to and it is shown in the darkness. Outside of Christ, all things are dark. John continues and says, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now he goes on and as he's pointing us and leading us towards the revelation of who this word is, he talks about this man named John the Baptist saying that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now John came, why? As a witness to testify concerning the light. He came as a forerunner to prepare the way of the Lord, proclaiming repentance for our sins. And he was a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. Now John himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. People then knew about John the Baptist and his role is important to bring testimony, preparing the way for Christ. Now verse 9 continues this way, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive so this light was revealed, and now this light is rejected. He is the light rejected. So there is light, and in contrast, there is darkness in opposition to the light. But the darkness cannot overcome the light. We can say amen to that. By the very nature of what light is, if there is a light and the darkness, the darkness must by its very nature recede and be penetrated by what is light. There is a contrast of these things. 
and the darkness <laughs> oppose the light cannot overcome it, but there is a battle that has been raging from the dawn of creation between light and darkness. Darkness will not win. Now John the Baptist came as a witness to the light. And John the Baptist, of course, was not the light. And some asked, are you the one that we are anticipating. These were the Jewish people who understood the Old Testament, longed for their Redeemer, their Savior, their King, the Messiah. And they were looking and wondering. But John was not that person, but he prepared the way of the Lord. Christ, of course, is the true light that gives light to everyone. And he came into the world. But the sad reality of this is that the very creator of all things was not recognized by what or those he had created. They thought he was perhaps just like another person. They thought perhaps that Jesus was an imposter. There was a rejection Initially, by most, to this light. Initially came to those he selected to be his own. These were the people of God called out through Abraham and the Old Testament. And we can see the story of Christ in all throughout the Bible from creation, by the way, these are up here, <laughs> to fall, to redemption, to recreation. This is of that story. He came to them, to the Jews first, and they did not in large receive him. He was rejected by his own. Yet, John 1.12 says, but yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, not in this Jewish line, children born not of human decision or of a husband's will, those who receive him, those who believe in his name are born of God. Includes you if you believe, includes me if we believe. And we'll see this as we follow what is written for us in John chapter 3, this experience of being born anew, being born of the Spirit, being born again. Those who receive Him, believe on Him, have the right to become children of God. He is not just the light revealed, not just the light rejected, but He is the light received. Yet there are those who did receive him, and we receive him how? By believing in his name. He gave all those who have received, all those who have believed, the right to become his children. The children of God. And this does not mean that everyone born on this planet is a child in this way of God. Now in one sense, we are all created by God, so we can say generically we're children of God. But this is a specific family that has received knowledge and believe that Jesus is indeed creator. He is indeed the Christ. He is indeed the Lord. Received what is true about him, what he did for us by redeeming us from the darkness. 
by paying the penalty of our darkness, our sin. This is the center point of the gospel. Who is Christ, what he has done, and the hope we have in him. The life, which is the light, can be received by all those who believe. Jesus is unique, different from all others. Acts tells us this in chapter 4, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no under, there's no other name under heaven given among humankind by which we must be saved. Jesus matters. He's not one way to God. He is the way to God. That's why it's important that we proclaim who he is to the nations. That's why it's important that we proclaim him and exalt him and see him higher and greater and bigger, better and over all things. Next, John moves into the greatness of his glory. He's setting us up, talking from in the beginning, like Genesis talked about. This is a new beginning. It's the beginning, the new beginning. Talking about what this person is, talking about who this person is, and now talking about his greatness and that he is life and he is light. The importance of receiving him and now going on to greatness of his glory. Verse 14, the first part, chapter 1. The Word became flesh, human. That's mind-blowing of itself. And made His dwelling among us. What God became part of its creation? There's no other in other religions. None like this one. And the Word, the eternal Word that everything is about and holds together became one of us, took on human form and walked among us as one of us, right? Tabernacle, this is what this word means, dwelt among, pitched his tent among us. The message says that he became flesh and he moved into the neighborhood, This creator, the word, that gave life and was like to all things, walked among us, taking the very form of a human <coughs> and lived among us. His glory is becoming flesh and living among us. This is mind-blowing. His glory is to leave. This is a complex sentence, so here we go. His glory is to leave his glory, to give us his glory, by glorifying his Father and being glorified by the Father among us. There's a lot there I cannot unpack at all. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Not right, well, you can go right there. I'm not going to open it up. Philippians chapter 2 fleshes this out. Philippians 2, 6 and 11. Please read that at another time. Right? Talks about these things. So his glory is becoming flesh and living among us. The text continues, we have seen his glory. This is the glory of the one and only Son, unique, different, who came from the Father, full of grace and 
truth. The part of his glory is being full of grace and truth. He is not one more than the other. He is both of these things. And you and I should be grateful that he came this way. If Jesus just came in truth, you better watch out. The truth can set you free, but it can also destroy you. And he also came in grace. A combination of what not just the law was, the law, he came as the truth, which is greater than, the law comes from the truth. He came in truth and he came in grace. It says full of, to the brim of both grace and truth. This word walked among us, the creator of all things, full of grace, full of Truth in perfect harmony, possessing both of these things intertwined together. This is the glory of Christ coming in truth as he is the truth, coming in grace because he is grace. Truth to us, grace. To us. This is Christ. Verse 15 says, John, this is John the Baptist, Baptist, testified concerning him. Now he cried out, saying, and I can imagine wherever this was, be it on the banks of the Jordan or in the Jordan, and there's crowds of people, and here is Christ looking like any other good Jewish man at that time, right? Didn't have this halo, he didn't have this blue sash, right, that we all picture him with. He looked like anybody else. But John knew he was unlike everyone else. And I imagine John, can you imagine this? I'm getting choked up just thinking about it. Here he is preaching. People are coming to be baptized. And he looks up, and they are walking among them. It was the lights. And I can imagine him saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before. Incredible. John knew, even though he's younger than me, he's before me. He surpassed me because he's before me and he's before us all. The, his glory is being before and above all things. He has surpassed all things because he is before all things. And because he's before all things and created all things, all things are his. And he owns and he holds all things together for himself. Again, he's unlike anything and everyone. He surpasses us all. There's no one like him. God, help us to never diminish his greatness. God, help us to fall deeper in love with him. This next line is, I I love this line, John 1, 16. Now, out of his overflow, out of his complete fullness, we have all received grace In place of grace already given. There's lots of different versions of this. But his glory is given. His glory is giving us grace heaped upon grace. (laughs) That's his glory, right? We see grace all throughout the Old Testament. And some people say, well, the Old Testament, God seems pretty mean. But in the New Testament, he seems pretty loving. Guess what? Same God... 
right? In his truth, in his strength, there was always grace. A way out. You can see this woven and stitched in the Old Testament. This God of truth is also this God of grace given to us in common grace from creation and specific grace from his word, from his prophets, by his spirit. And in Christ, God heaped grace upon grace that was already given to us. Grace in its fullness. Grace in its abounding greatness. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Right? God has always been a God of truth. God has always been a God of grace. And in Christ, we get grace heaped upon grace already given to us. Say, praise be to God. Praise be to God. There is no one like him. There is no one who is as great as him. This is the grace of becoming a child of God through him. Because we are born anew in him. By he who is grace and truth. John continues in verse 17 and 18. For the law was given through Moses and they understood that. We need to understand this. This is the law in the Old Testament. Ten commandments and those that fit underneath those commandments. The law was given through Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, no one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God. And he is in closest relationship with the Father. He has made him known. The Son has made the Father known. So his glory is making the Father known. This is part of the glory of Christ. And so we know the law, right? This is a result of who God is and how we are to relate to him. We know this through what God has given to and through Moses. But now we know grace and truth. These are made full and coming through Jesus Christ. Hebrews talks about the Son being the exact representation of the Father. This is Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It says this about Christ, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus is these things, and he upholds the universe. By the word of his power. Christ, the exact imprint of the nature of God the Father. And so we are to know the Father by beholding the Son. Right? If you want to understand the glories of God the Father, we look to the glories of God the Son and understand as he tabernacled, made a tent, moved into our neighborhood, into our heart, what he is about. This is the God being made known through the person of Christ, being empowered and illuminated by his spirit. This is Christ and his glory was to show us the Father. If you want to know the Father, look at the Son. And as we go through the Gospel of John, and we're, we're going to spend 16 weeks in this, I want to encourage you to look at these things and think about if you were a new person hearing these words for the first time, what this means, who this is. And we'll unpack some of these things in this series, but for today... I want you to know and honor the greatness of the word, the greatness of his life, the greatness of his glory. And knowing these things helps to 
protect us from being led astray, helps us to rightly know who He is so that we can worship Him in spirit and in truth, helps us to live in accordance to these things that are true about Christ, these facts about Christ, this revelation and this information is given as evidence so that we can believe and have life in His name. That's the point of this series. That's the point of all of these sermons, that you and I may believe. So at this time, we're going to transition into communion together. We're going to conclude with a, a powerful song. I believe Dan is going to lead us. And again, come on up. And again, I'm asking you to um, really think about this. I cannot do justice. I don't know if any person can do justice to these words because they are powerful and profound. Let them soak in and impact your heart and your mind.